G'day guys, thanks for tuning into the True Footy Podcast. Before we get into today's episode, I do need to tell you a little bit about today's sponsor. Now, I know you're at home watching this thinking, gee, Jesse's head is looking very nice and shaved. Well, frankly, you should see my balls. And that is because True Footy is lucky enough to be sponsored by the best in men's grooming, Manscaped. They're the best in below the belt men's grooming and they offer precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past, and frankly, you need to gear up and get yourself Manscaped's new Perfect Package 3.0. The holiday season is coming up, and if you're a male like me watching this, I know, I know you'll be struggling for Christmas gift ideas. Now, we're all men here. I'm sure we can all think of an example of a time where we had a little mishap grooming our nuts. But thankfully, this revolutionary company, Manscaped, has redesigned the electric trimmer. Two of the best parts of this product are that it's got advanced skin safe technology with a ceramic blade to reduce cuts on your nuts. And additionally, it's conveniently waterproof, so you can use it in the shower. The Lawnmower 3.0 comes within Manscaped's Perfect Package 3.0, which truly makes it the greatest holiday gift this season. It's everything you need to keep trimmed, cut free, and smelling nice down there. Now I know what some of you are thinking, oh, I've already got a shaver for my face, I'll just use that on my balls. No, no. That is gross, get a new one. Now the Perfect Package 3.0, which includes the Lawnmower 3.0, also has some extra products, including the Crop Preserver, and anti-ball chafing deodorant and moisturizer. Now we all put deodorant on our armpits, so let's not be too naive to think that our balls don't get real stanky. Speaking of sweaty and stinky balls, I'm also thankful for their new product, the Crop Reviver, again, part of this perfect package as well. On top of all that, you get a free pair of Manscaped jocks thrown in as well, which is a nice little treat. Tis the season to Manscaped, so get yourself, your brother, your cousins, your mates, anyone you can think of, make sure you get them this gift. And if you go through True Footy, you do get a nice healthy discount. If you go to manscaped.com and use the code TRUEFOOTY20, all caps, or one word, you actually get 20% off your purchase and free shipping as well. Manscaped have been wonderful in helping us develop and grow the channel and build towards the future. So if you are interested in their products, make sure you use this code as well so they know that we sent you. So like I said guys, manscaped.com, true 20 all caps, all one word, you get 20% off and free shipping. Now that's enough scrotum talk, let's get into the podcast. All right, here we are once again for True Footy Podcast 65, I think it is, Bush. And today we've got a another special one. In fact, Lenny, you might be the most asked for guest we've had on the podcast. I've I don't certainly know. seen a few comments and yeah. on a few vids lately. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if Bush has said anything, but um, we've been getting a lot of comments saying, bring back Lenny from last year's draft preview. So um, good to have you. How are you going, mate? Oh, mate, I'm good. Um, thank you for the kind words. And it's truly an honor to be back here on the True Footy Podcast. Oh, thanks, mate. Appreciate that. Um, I guess for anyone who might not have seen last year's episode where we just sort of go through the draft and stuff like that, maybe do you want to tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what, you, what it is that you do? Yep. So... Um, I do a bit of work with uh, the WA AFL draft prospects over here. So uh, between 2016 and 2018, I worked for the Subiaco Football Club, helping out uh, a lot of their draft hopefuls, guys like Brian Ainsworth, Benny Miller, Kyron Hayden. Um, and then probably for the last two years, I've been helping out WA as a whole with um, everyone, every player from WA. Um, yeah, and it's just a great job, I suppose, to be a, a part of. Yeah, cool. You worked a bit with that 18s team for won the Nationals last year or the year before, wasn't it? Didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah did, I with them. did. Yep, I helped that. And don't worry, I tell all my mates that I was the main reason uh, we won the championships. <laughs> <laughs> as you would, as yep. you would. No, yep. that's cool, man. Um, I guess because you've worked, um, oh, I was going to say as well, like last year, watching back, you can really mm. see the the difference between us tryhards in the media who I uh, <laughs> think we know a little bit about the draft and someone like yourself who's got quite a... Uh, quite a good knowledge. Um, I guess first thing I want to ask you is 2020 has been a bizarre year. Yep. Um, I was watching back on last year's episode, uh, sort of in preparation for this one. And it was just funny to think we were talking about Marlon Pickett in the grand final and, um, you know, just how we were, we were sort of having an early look at the 2020 draft. And it was just interesting to think things were normal back then. Yep. It's so much has happened in that year. Yep. I guess for someone who's working sort of in the industry, what has the year been like for you professionally? Oh, it's been uh, absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of people at the Football Commission, or when I say lost, they've yeah. uh, lost their jobs, yes, um, yeah. including probably the man who I would say has had the greatest impact on me understanding list management and drafting in Michael Ablett. 
Um, so from that perspective, it's really been, I suppose, disappointing that a lot of my mentors there probably aren't still there. Um, and obviously, you know, only having half a season of football, mm. or I suppose in AFL terms, it was pretty much a full season. But in terms of uh, WAFL Colts and, well, there was no under-18 championships, which is a bit uh, disappointing. So I think it was just a frustrating year from a footballing perspective. For sure, for sure. You mentioned it there briefly, but there was no 18 championships this year. Do you reckon that's impacted it much, like sort of generally? Oh, like, big yeah, time. Like, yeah, yeah has, big time. How specifically sort of thing? like. Um, so obviously, like last year, for example, um, there were guys like Chatty Warner who might not have been talked about as much at the start of the year, but after playing for WA, clubs could see that he could match it with, um, I suppose, the other stars of the under-18s competitions. And so suddenly he got a bit more publicity. Mm. Um, whereas this year, unfortunately, guys like obviously Logan McDonald, who a lot of West Australian people probably have heard about, and Denver Granger they're probably fine not playing under 18 okay. championships. But there's probably some other kids who might have really needed a big under 18 championships to really yeah. catapult themselves into draft contention. Mm. Or even just to rise um, a few draft boards. For sure, for sure. I mean, what, how do you think this year's been for draftees, like in terms of coping with the pressure of it? Because, yeah. um, you know, there was talk at one point of no draft and stuff yeah. like that. And obviously the draft's going to be compromised and in it, in it already is in a certain way. With but the yeah. list sizes and stuff, that certainly yeah. impacts it. Yeah, do you have any on, insight on sort of how the kids are dealing with uh, with a tough year? And I think it's the final year of exams and yeah. and waste and all that. This is the same to you. Yeah. Isn't it, so. yeah, so it would have been... Oh, very difficult. Um, I think, I suppose, a shining light for the WA and the SA boys is that they were actually able to play half a year, mm. whereas I uh, do feel sorry for the Victorian boys who couldn't play at all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for a kid like Elijah Hollands, who missed last year with an ACL, suddenly he's missed out of footy for two years, mm. and suddenly he can't... Even though he's projected to go top 10, clubs might be going, or... Oh, is it really a risk versus reward situation? So yeah. I do feel sorry, again, for those uh, Victorian boys who just all they probably wanted to do was have a kick at a footy, hopefully dominate some games, and unfortunately they weren't able to this year. For sure. Like, yeah, I have to feel a bit for those kids. I mean, there's been, you know, tons of victims of COVID, lots of people across them, all these industries yeah. have lost their jobs, but these guys are in a particularly unlucky season where, you yeah. know, 12 months ago things were normal, and then this yeah. year... Um, their chances of getting drafted are completely compromised um, to some extent. Um, do you think, to what extent, maybe for like recruiters and clubs looking at this draft? Obviously, there's a lot less data on the kids, um, yeah. less football, less exposure, like we alluded to. Do you think generally there's a bit of a lack of confidence in this year's draft, or what effect do you think playing less footy will have? Um, one thing with recruiters that some general fans might not understand is they're also monitoring kids in future draft years. Yeah. So they might they might even send recruiters to the under 15s or under 14s championships just to get a gauge on that draft in three years' time. So yeah. they would have had notes on a lot of players from of this 2020 crop from last year. Um, I suppose that there's probably maybe a little bit of a lack of confidence in terms of maybe those kids who might have been a third round pick that they thought could have catapulted into a second round pick. Um, but, I mean, obviously, you've, I think every club is in that situation, so at least it's not, at least it's sort of Equal. fair, yeah, yeah in True. the sense that it's not every club, or not. it's not that some clubs have seen some kids play a lot more than other clubs, but... Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I do think I was kind of thinking um, in a way, way like most of the for most players, it's a disadvantage this year. But I was thinking it's probably actually worked out decently for someone like Logan McDonald because I was thinking yep. he's played the year in Waffle Seniors and there obviously was a nine game season. Yep. Um, he finished in the team of the year, if I'm not mistaken, and yep. high up in the goal scoring. I don't think he uh, he was second, second, yeah. second to Mason Shaw. So yeah, sure. agree. Yep. So not not to like sort of um, undermine Logan McDonald because he's an absolute superstar, but I was thinking if, if that's an 18 goal season for an 18 year old kid or 17 year old kid to play the whole season like that, he might not have sustained that form and might not yeah. have finished second in the in the. So it's kind of worked out well in a way. Like if you play well in the nine games that you get, then yeah. it's really good for you. Yeah, absolutely. And look, absolute credit to Logan. Obviously, mm. when the season was in shutdown, um, it's quite obvious that he would have been been putting in a lot of work to get stronger and fitter or mm. to maintain his fitness um another kid who 
probably help with the nine games was Denver Granger Barras yep. at Swan District. So he's a key defender and obviously maybe after maybe 15 games his body might have tired True. and then maybe yeah. you know a big stronger key form might have been able to move him out of the way easily which then could possibly impact his draft standing so in a lot of ways yes you might have a lot of negatives but you also need to look at the positives For as sure. well yeah totally um i did sort of allude to how the draft is compromised this year so um Generally speaking, I think that obviously there's reduced list sizes and I think they've relaxed the rules so that clubs can only take, uh, only need to take one pick as a minimum, whereas yep. it used to be three. Yep. Um, there's talk a bit about um, mid-season drafts next year. Like, what yep. are your thoughts on that? And do you have any sort of clarity yep. as to whether that, that's going to happen? Or yep. um, So with this draft, uh, it looks like it'll be a draft selections between 50 and 65 yeah. that's what it's looking like this year which is a bit shallow isn't it normally yeah. it's a bit more than that yeah. right yeah yeah um so and um, with regards to mid-season or going back to what you were saying uh, about uh there being no draft at all i thought if there was to be a draft this year i thought it should have been mature ages only yeah okay. like a mature age draft bit like the mid-season draft mm. um purely also because it's probably easier to find or I suppose, analyse a player who's been playing senior football for five years compared to a yeah. kid who you might not have seen before. I was going to ask that question, actually. Did you think clubs are going to lean towards mature players in this draft? Because I've got more data on them, obviously. Like that was, yeah, You've sort of alluded to it there. Yeah. I had that question as well. <laughs> That's all good. Um, oh, if I was a list manager, I'd probably maybe use one pick on maybe the best 18s kid. And then if there was a few more, you then might look at mature ages. But... Again, like you might have seen some list management team, they might have done a whole heap of research on these uh, kids and mm. they might go, they might pick out the next superstar. So Yeah, true. Like yeah, there's, there's something to be said, it's almost better to have a later pick this year um, rather than a, a top one because the top picks are kind of devalued because of the lack of exposure. So you're more likely to get... Um, say at pick 37 someone that with a, who could have had a good year would have bolted into the top 10 like there's more yeah. chance of that as well so yeah. it's almost like a bad year to be someone like an Adelaide who really needs to get in the, the good young best prospects across Australia and they're gonna it's a little bit compromised for them as well but yeah, yeah can't really help that but you're, you're kind of an advocate of sort of maybe players being drafted a bit older anyway yeah. aren't you? I remember we were talking about that last year so yeah. a lot of these kids who maybe don't get picked up this year can go back into the system next year, play six yep. months of waffle or whatever, yep. um, and then potentially go into the mid-season draft, it probably would be better yep. for them, eh? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think the way the standard of the waffle and the SANFL and all the other state leagues is growing, I think it will also really help their development. Um, so, for example, one player, Jake Riccardi, who was mm. in the VFL last year, he got picked up. He's already stronger in the body. He's got the set shot routine. And he just probably looks a lot more comfortable at senior level than I think if he got picked up at 18. Yeah. Because you also don't know, he might have gone delisted the next year. True, yeah. And then unfortunately for a lot of those players, it's almost as if their uh, papers are stamped and they can't mm. get back into the system. One player that comes to mind that you probably know is Dylan Main for the West Coast. Um, yep. Taking pick 57, whatever, in 2013. And yep. then wasn't really, he's always going to be a long-term prospect. Yep. Took a couple of years and didn't, Make his and make a name for himself at A level. level. Yep. Gets delisted, and he's is he captain of South Fremantle, or at yeah. least he's, a, he's yeah, a very good player. He, he there, was so. the South Fremantle Premiership captain this year. So yeah, there you go. So yeah, and that one, and another classic player in my opinion, who yep. probably has the tools to play AFL, but yep. wasn't given the time. So yeah, yeah. and uh, I think also if he was selected at twenty one, he can probably get his body right because yeah. when he was younger, he was quite skinny, and then yeah. obviously playing against big bodies they're not going to be light on you so yeah. they're going to they're out there to make a living do their job they're not going to take it easy on you yeah. that was actually another interesting insight I think it was Tanner Brun I was listening to on the uh, Road to the Draft podcast was saying that the other opportunity or upside for the Vic kids who didn't play much footy this year is actually they got to spend more time in the gym so yeah. actually spending like a full time almost like a pre-season regime sort of developing themselves so you could see guys at the top end like a Tanner Bruin maybe yeah. who I think was skinny to begin with if I'm not yeah. mistaken he was kind yeah. of a light bodied midfielder yeah maybe he goes uh, and maybe he's a lot more ready for round one next year because yeah. he'll, he'll probably get drafted right so yeah yeah um We'll move on a little bit. Now, we do talk a little bit about WA prospects. Naturally, we're WA-based, as yep. are you, Lenny. So you have a good understanding of the WA kids. Um, so we will obviously, for those over East, we will talk more about the, the rest of the draft later. But I am curious as to know what's, uh, what's your opinion, uh, maybe firstly on the draft in general in terms of yep. depth. Um, yep. How do you think 
it compares to previous years, um, yeah. not just WA, but yeah. um, for the whole pool. Yeah, so obviously, as we've alluded to, it's probably going to be it's probably the most speculative draft sure. in history. Yeah. Um, or apart from the first one, when mm. probably no one had any idea what was going on. Um, Trade force buds for pick one that happened a few times <laughs> in the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I think probably the first 20, first 25 are going to be very, very good players. Um, but then it's probably harder with those depth players or the kids who we probably didn't get the chance to really catapult themselves. Mm. Um, but I do think that probably the first 20 to 25 picks are going to be good. And it does look like it's going to be a key position draft, especially within the first round. Yes, I was looking at the um, at uh, Toomey's fandom form garden that so yeah. much of that top five potentially even the first four picks in some fandom drafts i've seen are yeah. all tall so yeah. yeah it's a pretty interesting year um I, and now back to the wa focus yep. last year i remember there was a it was a pretty strong uh pool um, yep. i'm trying to think off the top of my head but mine's gone blank who was taken for wa uh early um De- i think devin De- robinson De- was De- taken De- in De- the De- early De- 20s but there was someone really early last year oh mitch georgiati's oh, also De- shot yeah. up the draft yeah, board 18, yeah um, um uh, there's someone Luke else. Jackson. Luke Jackson, Jackson pick yeah. three. That was the main one. I knew there was someone in the top AM for my mind just completely yeah. went blank. I saw Luke Jackson out the other night, so I yeah. totally know who he is. I like, completely <laughs> yeah. blank for a second. But long story short, um, you, you compared last year, 2019 to 2016, yeah. where we had four first round uh, draft yeah. picks for WA. I guess by comparison, how does this year's pool stack up? It looks pretty good from the outside. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think another f- reason why it was just so devastating that there was no under-18 championships is because I genuinely believe we could have gone back-to-back yeah. as champs. I think we would have had a very balanced team. Mm. Um, and the thing is, probably in the past with WAs, there's probably been like maybe a couple of A-plus grade players, and but then the, I suppose the drop-off has yeah. been quite uh, big. True. Whereas this year, there was probably A-plus, A-grade, and then B-plus wasn't really like A plus, B minus, if yeah. that makes sense. So yeah. um, I thought we would have been a good chance to win it. Um, and look, there's a good chance we might have two players within the top three selections this yeah. year. Also, and then possibly another four within the first round. So. Yeah, that's that's pretty outstanding, isn't it? Um, I talk about guys like Logan McDonald and yep. Granger Barras, as you alluded to, probably guys in the top five or so, or yep. potentially top three. Yep. Uh, and then a couple have come to mind, are Nathan O'Driscoll from Perth yep. um, and uh, Heath Chapman. There's probably a few other guys you could name for yeah. being... Uh, where do you think O'Driscoll, I guess, his range is? Because I've seen a few different opinions on where he lands. Some yep. have him closer to the top ten, some have him sliding a little bit yep. like Robertson did. What's your yep. thoughts on someone like him? I think possibly early 20s yep. for uh, Nath. Um I think Heath Chapman's probably one that could push top ten as well. Um, but I think if he doesn't, he'll certainly go within the top 15 picks. He's just too good a player to be sliding. Mm. Um, another boy who probably doesn't get as much recognition as what he should is a young fella called Zane True oh, yeah, from yeah. Swan District. So he's a big-bodied midfielder and he's similar to a Trent Koch and Clayton Oliver midfielder, like that guy that can just get the ball and feed it out to his uh, teammates. Um, and then one kid who could do a bit of a Mitch Georgiades and completely bold. Everyone is young. Isaiah Winder from Peel Thunder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So Isaiah's an indigenous boy from Bunbury and he's travelled from Bunbury to Mandra to train and to play uh, this year. Um, So he's shown a real good dedication. And the thing that I really uh, admire about uh, Isaiah was his willingness to improve his defensive side of the game. So offensively he was probably the most gifted player in the wa hub this year but um obviously he probably needs to work on his defense and he really has worked on that and i think it's a real credit to him uh, uh, to try and improve his game yeah awesome that's good to hear i do know a little bit about uh as i went we have a friend druzy as our, as the audience would know yep. um who works at peel and uh, he's a big fan of um of his work as well yep. um I guess on this draft, one of the other big talking points about this year is obviously the the academy um, situation oh, yeah. where uh, it's the most compromised draft in um, in history and that this might be the first time that an academy pick could potentially go pick one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It's probably the first time. And yeah. Jamara Ugal Hagen. Yep. Um, you can probably live with it if it's a father-son, but I feel yeah. like for me personally, a next-generation academy pick, going pick one is a little dubious um, to someone like the Bulldogs where the connection's probably not that strong um i guess what are your views on the academy situation um this year and and obviously the rules have changed what are are your thoughts on it all um 
I think I was saying to Busher off He was alluding this is going to be a spicy one. <laughs> oh, yeah? Um, look, I think if you're a club and you've put three to four years into developing not just the player but the person mm. and then suddenly they can't be uh, given to you, mm. um, I think would be very disappointing, especially from a Bulldogs perspective. They've Jamar is uh, one of the most exciting and explosive players uh, that I've seen come through the under-18s. Oh, that I've heard of come through the under-18s, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, and some clubs might say it's unfair, but I think it's totally fair if you're putting three to four years in. I mean, if he was only in the Bulldogs for one year, I yeah. think it would be totally fair. But I think when you're spending that much time and that uh, many resources on a kid, you should probably have first rights to him. Yeah. Um, and possibly something in the future is they might have to give every club just an academy and they can just develop those kids through their academy and maybe instead of a draft it's sort of back to the olden days where you rise up through the under 18s and the Colts you then might play resis and then hopefully you can make it into the league side yeah that, that is an interesting perspective I guess because I mean I'll put my hand up and say you're well more well versed on this yeah. than myself but I guess the counter argument for the the next generation academy picks um, and just for clarity yeah. the rules have changed next year obviously so yeah. if it picks inside the top 20 yeah. would be open pool so you Ugo you, Hagen you Braden Campbell uh, yeah. they would be open pool and then anything after that would be able to bid on but yeah. I think the the counter argument is the point of the academy is to sort of if I'm not mistaken yeah. uh, find these sort of um, what's the word uh, speculative oh, talents up. diamonds in the rough who might not have had a yeah. clear path to the AFL yeah. and bring them into the system and develop them yeah but what might have happened is that these kids, they're picking up kids who were probably always going to get drafted early, perhaps yeah. an Ugal Hagen, I'm not sure, yeah. um, and then just sort of yeah. being able to claim rights to it. What do, you, what do you think about that? Oh, and if it's from that perspective, I can totally understand. Sure. That's probably why I went the one year, if they're on the, sure. the academy for one year, it's probably very unfair. But yeah. I think, um, like for instance, a couple of years ago, Liam Henry probably wasn't even meant to be going first round, but then because yeah. he had such a great under 18 championships, he was able to go first round. Fortunately for us, Docker fans, Bush. Yeah, um, yeah. But and We've slid back a little this year, but I'm more than happy to pay that price for Liam. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so, and the other thing probably with the academy is that it's not just about developing footballers, it's about developing the person as well. So, for instance, one kid who I had quite a bit of work to do with last year was Lino Thomas. Mm -hmm. And so Lino uh, had to relocate from a small country town up north where the population might have been 150 people, and then he's come down to Perth where the population is much more than that. Um, he was able to get an education through the academy. He went to Clontarf, and he was able to find a full-time job apart from football as well. Mm. So, that, yes, it can be good for, I suppose, developing players and all that, but they're also really important for developing good people. Yeah, okay, that's that's an interesting um, insight that sort of the yeah, average football yeah. fan doesn't really think about. They just think about the fairness of the league. Um, yeah, no, that's, that is interesting. I guess for me, you sort of alluded to it, like with the future with academies and stuff. Yeah. Um, as someone who I really do like the idea of maybe not equalisation, but I just sort of establishing fairness. So I, yeah. I'm, what my fear would be that someone like a... Collingwood or West Coast with the best resources and stuff yeah. like that may be able to just churn out all this WA and Victorian talent. Yeah. And then, you know, you got your teams like Gold Coast who probably produce a... Uh, or a Gold Coast Academy player who produce an elite player like once in a blue moon. I, yeah. Well, it sounds like... Actually, I was reading something with the Gold Coast because they get their Academy kids for free because of that deal they got cut a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So like, they're getting a couple of good kids out of Darwin and stuff because Darwin yeah. got added to their regions, I think. Yep. Yeah. Um, but maybe from a WA perspective, it might be that uh, in the future, Fremantle might have dibs on maybe the Claremont players, the two Fremantle teams in Peel, yeah. whereas West Coast might have, you know, Subiaco, Perth, yeah. West Perth, Swans, uh, and East Perth. Um, and so then it's probably easier to discuss it from a Perth and SA perspective because sure. you can divide the SA and FL clubs into half. Quite whereas, easily, yeah. yeah. And that's probably why the argument's coming... Uh, more from the Victorian clubs because when you've got 10 clubs in your state it's harder to divide up the regions mm. um, still they can split up country Victoria as well there's a depth of talent in country Victoria that we don't have in regional WA for example yeah mm. we did have a golden era where Geraldton produced all this elite well, talent yeah, and Geraldton, they dried up Geraldton's well. pretty constant with the talent but, uh, yeah, yeah Geraldton's a weird outlier in uh, WA for yeah. comparatively the elite talent that's come yeah. from Geraldton yeah, versus like Bunbury it's, it's like ridiculous. Northampton Gerro or something yeah. Like yeah, yeah yeah for those over East who might not understand it's you got your Jager Romero, Paddy Cripps, Jamie Cripps, Jack Martin. They're all oh, Jack Martin's from 
Broom, but he did no, play he played, footy up there. He played footy in Joe. Yeah. Liam Ryan Harry played Harry Taylor, up there. older name. I think Bunbury's claim to fame is Neville Jetta, Adam Hunter, Lewis Jetta, <laughs> and that's about it off the yeah. top of my head. No, I'm yeah. sure there's more than that, but yeah, yeah it's it's a strange Even one. historical Joe one, Maney. Yeah, yeah. Maney. Daniel Chick. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Another uh, country town is like Albany. Oh, yes. Which is similar yep. to Joe, like some of the elite talent, like true. Jeremy Mc- McGovern boys, yeah. both from there. Um, Good point. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we could probably sort of delve into a little bit of the top ten talk. Um, it's a little bit early in the year to be going depth into like full on phantom drafts, but yep. um, last year I think we went through the top ten, and it was good chat. So we'll start at the top. Um, I guess the obvious one here is we sort of talked about Jamara Ubel Hagen. Yeah. To what extent is it possible he doesn't get bid on, and what, what are your thoughts on him? Oh, he's clearly one of the most exciting players in this draft pool, mm. uh, if not the most exciting. Um, if he doesn't get bid on, it won't be long till he gets bid on now. Yeah. I think he'll be bid on within the top four yeah, selections. To, to clarify, sorry, I meant bid on pick one. He's certainly going to get bid on in general, but yeah, yeah no. Yeah. Bid, I <laughs> yeah, mean, sorry, I've only yeah, got that wrong. Yeah, no. uh, yeah, so certainly if he doesn't go pick one, it'll be mm. within top four, I would say. Um, n- now... So, obviously, Adelaide might look at him because he's an exciting key forward um, and they probably need that explosive forward in the front half. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think, um, well, they've probably got a choice between Ugo Hagen and then two other big key forwards. It's probably yeah. the, the two they're all talking about. So, for me, it makes sense to bid on Ugo Hagen. I think that's where the talent, that's where he's ranked. But I wonder if there's a romantic part of him that wants pick one. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think there's any temptation Adelaide to like okay, we could bid on him. He's definitely going to get matched and the Bulldogs get yep. pick one, but otherwise we could prize and market this kid as our next pick one, say a Logan McDonald or a yep. Phil Thorpe. Do you think there'd be any temptation to do that? Oh, I, I think so, um, yeah. because there's a bit more prestige with yeah. a number one pick compared to a number two pick. Not that there's anything diminishing from being taken pick two, <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah, there is, I suppose, it's more of a feather in the cap to go pick one and exactly. it's probably easier to market a kid, yeah. say, number one. In saying that, though, um, it can also backfire because yeah. you look at Jack Watts at Melbourne, mm. who was touted to be the saviour of that football club, and there's just so much pressure yeah. on him. So from an Adelaide perspective, if they do take a McDonald, Phil Thorpe, whoever, um, I'd try and uh, undersell them and then let that kid over-deliver. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a good rebuttal, actually. I think there is probably a lot of merit to the idea that maybe don't put the pressure of pick one just for, <laughs> yeah. the, for the sake of marketing. So, um, But we'll talk about Adelaide specifically now. I think we're comfortable. Mm. U- Ugo Hagen's getting to the yep. dogs. Yep. Um, you, they've got the choice of this homegrown Phil Thorpe. Everyone's linked uh, Phil Thorpe to, to the Crows because he's yep. South Australian. There's yep. people generally do. Yep. Um, and then there's a guy called Logan McDonald we talked about who, yep. f- as far as I can see, in my uneducated opinion, looks the superior of the two prospects. Yep. Um, what do you think they should do? And like, what, what's your opinion between the two players? Yep. Uh, both would be very deserving to go pick one. Yep. Um, if I'm Hamish Ogilvie, who's Adelaide's chief recruiting officer, I would probably go with Thilthorpe. Now, now th- this is very rare for me to pick someone other True. than a WA boy. True. Uh, but I also say that because Adelaide has had a problem retaining players in the past. Mm-hmm. And you saw that with Brad Crouch going to St Kilda. It's probably going to be a problem for a few more years until they turn it around, I'd say. Yeah, so I think... And I know that there's been talk about clubs need to not play it safe in drafting, but I Mm. think from an Adelaide perspective, they just want to get the base covered. They want to get uh, good quality, not just players, but good quality people to come into that football club. And that's probably why I'd go for Thilthorpe. Interesting. But also because... Apart from Riley O'Brien, I'm not sure who their other ruckman is. True. So if Phil Thorpe can come in, he can play as a forward and as a ruckman. Yeah. So I think they almost tick two boxes uh, with Riley compared to someone like Logan. Yeah, that's very well reasoned. Who do you think is the superior prospect, though? Uh, Logan. Logan, I th- yeah. I think Logan. I think when you're finishing second in the in a senior state league uh, goal kicking award it means you're a very special talent yes i'm inclined to agree with you i think his body of work probably does um slightly um cover phil thought one thing i did find interesting though was they all do kind of have links to adelaide logan mcdonald's yep. mum actually lives in south australia yep. which i read this morning um yep. so he does go there a lot that being said 
every I feel like Logan's such a sort of marketable player that you'd have a Collingwood banging down the door maybe even a Fremantle in a couple of years yeah. whereas that's less likely to be a threat for Philthorpe I, I see yeah. what you're saying so um, the other thing though that I really want to say about Logan is he's got a great head on him yep, yep he's very down to earth and this uh, rise to fame hasn't phased him at all mm. so and it's probably something I'm big on as well because if for instance, like you want the good people to come into your club because yeah. they generally can help you take you forward. They might not have as much talent as other players, but or well, Logan's obviously a different case to that. But yeah. you know, um, if he he suddenly starts going and being party boy, saying oh, I'm the best, then suddenly clubs might deter sure. away from him. So, uh, and as Paul Roos said, it's very important to get the right people into your football club to take it forward. Mm. Yeah, interesting. That's uh, that's good insight. I guess, so if you're saying, so we'll go Ugo Hagen, hypothetically pick one. Yep. You've got Phil Thorpe at two. Is it a no-brainer for North to jump on McDonald here? Interesting you bring this up because, and we spoke about off air about potential trade swaps. True. And there's one that's been coming up, and I think I would absolutely do it if I'm both teams. So the scenario of this would be Essendon send picks six and seven to North Melbourne for pick two. Now, the reason I would do that from both is... Essendon is very keen for a key forward. So regardless, they want either Thilthorpe or McDonald, big time, especially with Danaher gone. Um, and for North Melbourne, because they're rebuilding, they probably want to get three players uh, within, because they've also got pick 11, I believe. Yeah, I think 11, you're right. Pick 12. Yeah, something so right suddenly, yeah. And you look at what Port Adelaide did a couple of years ago when they got Rosie, Dersma, Butters. And Butters. So, so if you can... And also Stevenson's still young. Uh, two, I can't say his last name. The kid from Collingwood. Bozo yeah. Nervalagi. That's the one. <laughs> no, I can't say his last name. I took so. a punt. <laughs> I could have <laughs> got right, that so It's a lot better than mine. <laughs> um, and so suddenly uh, the new coach, David Noble, he can build around that nucleus of young talent coming through. Um, and obviously Essendon still retained pick eight. Yeah. So I True. think from both sides it makes perfect sense yes. to both think about strongly entertaining that deal. I like it. I'll add to that and suggest my own little theory here. Yep. Um, we talked about the Collingwood off-season PR debacle a lot on this podcast, yeah. on this channel generally. So yeah. that's, that's been a bit of a nightmare. But one thing that I think is probably undeniable is that there has to be some sort of plan here. So they talked yeah. about how much they want to trade into the draft. And they want to get rid of their future first as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So long story short, I, I'm not saying this will happen, but I think Collingwood is going to come hard with pick 14, 16, and maybe next year's first. So that yep. ends up being three mid-team picks. Yep. And we'll probably offer that to North Melbourne for pick two. Yep. Probably be a fairly, depending on what Essendon actually offers, that'll probably be a fairly tempting yep. one as well. I mean, you're moving yep. back from two, but you get yep. three first rounders for yeah. that. Yeah. And again, it's probably, that's interesting. I was saying they're still going to get good quality youngsters exactly. into that team that they can build around. And probably the reason why Collingwood is very interested in this in that deal is because they probably don't have a consistent key forward. Mm. And so by that, I mean, you know, when guys like Dugowie, when Stevenson was there, when Majacek Cox, when they were all on, they were probably, one. if they weren't the best, they were one of the best forward lines in the comp. True. But when they're all off, gee, it yeah. can be horrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, and Logan is quite consistent and or Thilthorpe is also consistent. So that way, those two boys, when they come in, all they have to do is just try and bring the ball to ground. And then that way you can allow like a small or player like a Dugowie or, you know, Jamie Elliott, even when he's in the forward line, to just crumb it. For sure. And yeah. so if you've just got someone who's consistent and they just do that job, it then helps out the forward line a lot, lot better. And so, for instance, you look at someone like West Coast, you look at what Josh Kennedy and Jack Darling do, now, they might not be the let's kick five goals every week, but you're more likely for them just to always fly for pack marks and they're mm. always going to bring it down to guys like Liam Ryan, although Liam's probably trying to stand on all their heads trying <laughs> to take mark in a year. Um, so that's probably why Collingwood's very keen to get a consistent key forward into their uh, team. Yeah, I think I think it's a juicy one. I think they'd love a key forward. Um, I think they probably would have targeted one had they not had salary cap issues. But yeah. I also just think I think Logan McDonald's actually a Collingwood fan too. Yeah, um, and I know is. they've been in contact with him. Um, but I, it would be good even just for a PR perspective, just to get a bit of a win. Just be like, yeah. we just traded three late first founders for a generational key forward talent. Yeah. They can really sell that to their fans, yeah. which is probably yeah. something they need to do. Yeah, um, I'd be worried when Ned Guy comes offering me a contract extension, though. I don't, <laughs> know, I keep, I don't know if he'd be able to keep his word Bush on it. Bush, Bush is filthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, nah, fair points, fair points. Um, we'll move down a little bit of the order. Uh, Elijah Hollands. 
Yep. Is he, in your opinion, the best available non-tall on offer? Or is Will Phillips, Phillips is another name that gets thrown out? I think the difference between the two is, well, obviously, Elijah's coming off a knee injury. Yeah. Um, the difference probably between the two is Elijah's more your explosive midfielder, like a young Christian Petrarca, mm-hmm. who, when he was on, it was fantastic, but yeah. it can go missing in games. Whereas Will Phillips is more like your consistent midfielder. He, he'll rack you up 30 touches with ease. Um, he's a future captain. Both would, both probably, it's a hard one to pick because they're different mm. sort of players. I mean, if you're looking for more damage per player or damage per possession player, you'd look at Elijah. But if you're looking for someone who can just slot into your midfield and can just be consistent, you'd probably looking at someone like Phillips. Yeah. Yeah, no, good call. I think that's a good summary. I think, so the next pick we do have is Sydney on the board. Yep. Uh, bearing in mind they've got Braden Campbell likely to be matched also within the top 10. I don't know what your thoughts yep. are on that. Yep, so, so my initial thinking was that they're, um, they're going to be looking at a tall, maybe just to yep. balance this out. I guess the choice is with all those talls gone, Denver, Granger, Barras, or yep. you know, your Hollands or Phillips, yep. where do you think they'll go with this pick? I think because they're going to get Braden within the top 10, and that's probably, they're also looking for a midfield star, but. Since Alia Alia has gone to Port Adelaide, mm. I think they'd be pretty smart to pick up Denver. He's almost a like-for-like replacement with Alia. Um, and suddenly they can also help shore up their defence and then they can still get a midfield star. And there's plenty of other midfielders in the draft pool for later sure. on for them to pick up. So uh, if I was Kenny Obitsen, I'd probably be saying, Denver, you're coming to Sydney. I agree with that. I think that's a really good summary. And they took Dylan Stevens high last year as well. Yeah, so true. Got that talent. Good point. And they've just got well. a reasonable young crop of mids. You've yeah. got Florence still there. Yeah. It's not too old. And you can go through. Yeah. yeah. The other thing which does surprise me is Luke Parker is still 27. So yeah. He's, he's still he's still young. Yeah. He's still young. Caught me off guard with that one. Mm-hmm. So shit. You, you sort of <laughs> glut him with the Hannabrys and the yeah. Josh Kennedy Sr. Uh, sorry, Josh Kennedy Sr. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Kennedy Jr. He's not that old. Um, so, but yeah, you're right. He's, um, yeah. he's a fantastic player player in the absolute prime of his uh, of his footy life um Hol- this this brings us to hawthorne who yep. are crying out for a key back in my opinion so yeah. they'll be like all right well let's add some tall talent and then bang 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 three out of the first four or whatever it is um are all talls gone yeah um so if do you think granger brass would probably be their number one priority if he's gone they're looking at hollands uh yeah i think that they'll either look at hollands or phillips now yep. i think they'll go for elijah hollands purely mm. because when you look at the midfield, they've got Mitchell, who's consistent. You've got O'Meara, who's consistent. But they probably don't have that explosive bull mm. in the midfield. Yep. Which, and Elijah is certainly that. And, you know, their medical team has been magnificent in the past, rejuvenating players' careers. Brian Lake, for yes. one. Yep. So um, I think they should look at Elijah, and he'd add a point of difference to that midfield mix. Yes, I agree with that. And I th- Hawthorne are not really a conservative club in terms of their recruiting. They'll generally just pick the guy they want, um, regardless of rankings. It doesn't seem like they'd go for a vanilla type. Well, now this is going back a long time ago, but when Buddy was drafted, a lot of clubs were put off him. Right. Whereas Hawthorne still went, no, we're going to take the risk. Uh, we're going to get him in. And look, Buddy, in my opinion, has gone on to be the best player that I've seen play the game. Um, so... Th- now I'm not trying to say Elijah's going to be that, but yeah, I know what you mean. they can. They're probably a club that can take that risk because their off field is so well. They, they do take that risk. You see it. They do yeah. take that risk. Often, like Dale Garlett's an example where they yeah. took that risk. Even like, Will Day last year, not a risk as such, but he was he was a bit of a reach compared to yeah. the like the consensus. Yeah. And yeah. they obviously saw his attributes. Mm. He's fast. He's skillful. Yeah. They're just going to pick the player that they think fits yeah. their brand. And I. I tend to agree. I think Hollands is more Hawthorne pick than someone like a Phillips yeah. as well. So. Um, and the other thing that is probably big on this is that when your off field is sort of like, you know, your board is strong, your coaching staff is strong, your uh, recruiting team is also aligned to the coaching staff, it allows you to take a risk on a kid like Elijah, mm. who might have come through with an injury. But because everyone's aligned and they've got all the resources uh, ready to help him, it probably helps a club like Hawthorne to take a risk like that. I agree. That's like you can see, Dimmer brought that over from when he worked at Hawthorne yeah. Richmond as well. That's another example that's, of how effective that sort yeah. of ethos is. And the thing as well is, Richmond now have all the right people involved at that club, and they're all aligned off field, and that's why they're doing yeah. so well off field, on, on field. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I and agree. they can take opportunities on guys like Marlon Pickett and Sydney yeah. Stack, that sort yeah. of thing. Whereas a club like Adelaide, which probably just needs to be conservative and get recreate probably, a good culture, they probably can't take a risk. Mm. 
Yes, yes. I agree with that. We'll move on to the Gold Coast Suns, yep. um, a club where we've talked about Will Phillips still being on the board. I believe there's a link to Raylan Anderson here. I think he's good friends yep. with them. Um, yep. Yep. He and played with them last year in, uh, in the Oakley Chargers. Gotcha. I've, I've seen him sort of compared to Raylan, I guess. Uh, maybe not strictly in playing style, but I just think he's just sort of like your reliable yep. captain, future yeah. captain of the club. Yep. Um, the other thing for me is that they have Alex Davies later in the yep. in the first round, I think, who's likely to be bid on another midfielder. So yep. it's not quite Gold ideal. Gold Coast doesn't get bid on. They just get there. Academies through the door. Good point. That is a thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. So either way, they're going to yeah. get Alex Davies. Yeah. So yeah. maybe not ideal to get a, another mid. But do you think Phillips is the man here? I think they actually might bid on a kid called Lachlan Jones, okay. who's yeah. uh, poor Adelaide. So because they're probably lacking a damaging halfback flanker mm. since Archie went to Brisbane. Uh, now, obviously, they brought in Brandon Ellis uh, last year to try and recreate that role. But I think yeah. Ellis is better on a wing. Um, and so I think they'll probably bid on Lockie Jones just purely because they probably need another outside or halfback flanker that can go into onto a wing position. Yeah. Um, now Port Adelaide, Port Adelaide will match that bid. I agree. Yeah. Um, and then I think they should take Will Phillips. Okay. Uh, now, and the reason I also say this is now for those who don't know, Matty Rendell, who is the former Collingwood and Adelaide recruiter, he just That's said a bit on trade radio. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he just said. Phillips' work rate is absolutely phenomenal and it's similar to Raul. So that's um, yeah. that's where the comparison is. Their work ethic is fantastic. And the thing is, Stewie Drew probably is wanting the good working footballers in his team now rather than those explosive players that can turn a game True. that might only be in the game for five minutes. Yep. So I think... Yeah, and the other thing is, if he's a future captain, if Roll's a future captain, if Anderson's a future captain, suddenly you're building a good quality core of leadership within that football club. I totally agree. I think that's exactly what Gold Coast need, like you alluded to with Adelaide. Probably yep. uh, not quite as fragmented as it used to be, Gold Coast, so you can yep. sort of see they're on the right track now, yep. but you do kind of want to consolidate that, get yeah. the right guys in your club, and yeah. I think it'll be set them up for the future as well. Oh, so. And I think the way they're going, they could be playing finals very soon. Maybe not yeah. next year, but I think the year after, they can certainly yeah. be uh, contending. Yeah, there's enough talent on there to, yeah. uh, to be getting along with. Um, so I'm losing track now because we got we got bids in it, which really shows yeah, the, uh, sorry. the academy. No, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Stop throwing out bids. Nah. Um, <laughs> okay, so if we go with the fact that Essendon took, um, let's let's just for a bit of fun say Essendon take uh, McDonald to pick two. Yep. Uh, say North have the next couple of picks, but maybe not too fixated on the clubs. But I guess what players would you think if you had multiple picks around this range? Um, what kind of players would you be looking at uh, past uh, Will Phillips? <sighs> Uh, so I think from a North Melbourne perspective, they really want to shore up their defence. Sure. So they might look at a kid called Nick Cox, yep. who's uh, from the Northern Knights. He can play as a key forward, key defender. He's athletic, he's versatile, and he really does fly for his marks. And the reason I say that is midfielders can, you can generally find them later on in the draft, but a superstar key position player you want to get early in. Yes. Yep. So I think they'll go for that. And then they might even... Do a bid on if he hasn't been bidded on already. Uh, Braden Campbell. From oh, Sydney. true. So yeah, well, I forgot we. Yeah, I sorry, I thought see. we have bid on him. We mentioned him, but he hasn't yeah? been. Bid okay. on. Yeah, we'll, I don't, we'll I don't think we did now. bid on him. But yeah, no, this is around his range anyway. <laughs> yeah. I could see Gold Coast potentially bidding on him as well, yeah. but they might be sort of more um, into the into the Phillips pick as well. Yeah. Um. So yeah, okay. Let's say Campbell goes to Sydney then. So gee, Sydney's done well here. Yeah. Denver Granger Barras, Braden Campbell. Yeah, very good picks. God, God damn these academies. <laughs> Sydney does it every bloody year. They bloody get good talent through the door. Yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah. There's um there's a fair bit of talent go making their way to Sydney, which is annoying. Um. <laughs> and they didn't even take Josh Dunkley when they had the chance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a father son, but um yeah. yeah. Okay, so so where do we land on that? So Nick Cox, North Melbourne. Yep. You got Sydney matching a bit, I presume, yep, for Campbell. Yep. I think that's a no-brainer. And then North back on the clock. Yep. Uh, any other players around this range? One kid who might shoot up a little bit is Heath Chapman because yep. um, he can also play on a wing, whereas North mm. Melbourne probably have an abundance of inside midfielders. You sure. know, you've got Cunnington, Simpkin can go in there. Yeah, LDU. LDU. Yeah, LDU. Um, so the but they're probably lacking that wingman or another key defender in Chappie. Um, and I think he would beautifully set them up because he, with Higgins also gone, they're probably lacking that outside player. Sure. So I think it would make sense for them to possibly get Chappie in. And again, they've got some good people at that football club. You know, uh, Brady Rawlings, who was at West Coast and helped deliver them their flag in 2018 with their <laughs> list management. Yeah, that's super trade as well. Yeah. Um, 
the one where Gold Coast traded a first rounder for what ended up being like a one pick upgrade for like five second rounders or something yeah. stupid. We got Oscar yeah. Allen, Liam yeah. Ryan. That was uh, some yeah. good work. And <laughs> also David Noble has been for a rebuild before at Brisbane. So Yeah, true. So that's probably why they were hell bent on getting David Noble into that football club. As a quick aside, what do you guys think of the strategy that you've seen a bit lately of teams hiring like CEOs as coaches sort of thing, like front office guys as coaches? Is it... I think the difference yeah. is probably, so I'm assuming you're alluding to David Noble and Chris Fagan. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, the thing is, Fagan was an assistant coach at Melbourne. He, yeah. And also, when you're a footy operations manager, which he was at Hawthorne, you are essentially still mm, coaching yeah. in a mm. way. So it's not like they've just randomly gone, oh, we're picking up CEO yeah. Dale Alcock yeah, to so coach someone your with, team. <laughs> someone with a commerce degree. Yeah. I'll take a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they're actually getting... Oh, coach. <laughs> they're getting the right football people in to help take yeah. that football club forward. Yeah, yeah. and um, Noble, like you alluded to, a rebuild on the field with Brisbane, but also off the field with yeah. their culture around, um, yeah. you know, players leaving and stuff like yeah. that. So that's exactly what North Melbourne really want to establish. Yeah. So, yeah, a good little pick up for them. Um, so we've gone with uh, Chapman and Cox. I have no idea what pick number we're up to. <laughs> I think we must be close to eight or nine, but we'll go We'll go down. I think next is hypothetically Essendon here. Yeah. Um, having taken McDonald, who do you think yep. they'd look at? Oh, they probably... I think Essendon, they've been lacking a big-bodied midfielder. Mm-hmm. So when you look at their midfield, it's like, I think McGrath's 181, Parrish is 182, and they've got a few players that are around that early 180s, but they don't really have like a Cripps or a Bond sure. or a Fife. And Never that's replaced Joe Watson, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think they're going to look at a kid called Archie Perkins from yep. Sandringham. So he's about 189 centimetres. If he fills out a bit, he'll be that real big body in the midfield. Mm-hmm. He's quite explosive from stoppages. Um, and then if they pick him up and he can, let, let's say he consistently plays well, it allows then someone like Stringer to just play as a key forward rather than he has to go into the midfield, then True. he has to go forward, then he has to go in the midfield and then go forward. So... I think they really do need to find a big-bodied midfielder, even if it means with a later selection they pick up a mature-age player like a Jai Bolton mm. to come into that team and really help them out. True. Yep, I like it. Well-reasoned. Um, we'll move down to the Crows now. Again, we'll just go through the Crows and GWS because the last two picks. I think we might have actually passed 10 now, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So we've gone past that... Adelaide Crows again on the clock, having taken Phil Thorpe, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, I guess what picks... I think we can kind of agree. Adelaide sort of need to rebuild their entire list. list. They've got Brad Crouch out the door, so maybe an inside mid comes to mind. Yep. Probably don't need to go for another key forward. Yeah. Um, does someone like a Finlay McRae come into calculations this early, or is there someone perhaps better suited? Maybe uh, someone who you alluded to earlier on the podcast in Tanner Brun. Oh, yeah. So, yep. you know, he's a skillful midfielder, and that's probably what they're lacking, like... With all due respect, Sloan and Matt Crouch are probably your racking up possessions and can get the ball out, but they're probably not damaging by foot. Mm. Whereas Brun, he adds a point of difference into that midfield. And the reason why I say they probably need to add a point of difference is when you look at West Coast, for instance, you look at Shuey, who's different to Yo, who's yep. different to Gaff. Very so different. suddenly, because if you've got all similar players in that midfield, it can be easy to shut them off. Whereas, and you saw it in the 2018 Grand Final, that... Collingwood that were able to shut down Yo for the first half, but Chewy got off the chain. <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden, if you can get point of difference midfielders, they, it really does make you a much more damaging team. Yeah, it happened to the opposite. Uh, mm. Just talking about the Eagles. It happened the opposite in the qualifying final. They shut down Shuey and Yo destroyed Collingwood. They tagged Yo and then Shuey destroyed yeah. them in the grand final, which I love that. Yeah. Good thing I like about Dan Brun as well. He's a West Coast fan, yes. despite being Geelong based. So yeah. um, I like him already. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> cool. Um, I guess while we, well, I did touch on McRae because um, this is an interesting one for sort of casual yeah. fans of the draft because yeah. they're like, oh, McRae, his little brother. So yeah. how, do, how do they compare? Do you think stylistically? Between Jack and Finlay. Oh, gee, they're both skillful players. Yeah. Um, they both read the play really well. They're super composed. Um, Finlay's just probably got to get a bit more size on him. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, that's like every 18 year old kid. Um, and, oh, look, if GWS, who are the next pick, said they took him, I wouldn't be surprised because yeah. Finlay can also, Finlay, so it can also play in the forward half, mm-hmm. which is probably an area where they're lacking at the moment. Yeah. Um, so. I think it would make perfect sense for GWS to uh, pick him up. Yeah, love that. I think he gives up a bit of height on his brother. Is that right? I think yeah. he's, is Jack like 191, I want to say. Or is I think he 91's right. I think yeah, yeah, and then uh, I think Finlay's about 184. But yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. And not all brothers are going to be the same. <laughs> mm. um, cool. So, uh, well, that kind of rounds out our top 
12 or whatever. Yep. Um, so without going too far down the draft, it's a little bit pointless this early. Um, we'll talk about maybe your own club because this is yep. a good one. Uh, you're a Fremantle fan, if I'm yep. not mistaken, yep. who I think their, their picks pushed back to about 17. Is that right? Uh, so, so they were originally meant to get pick 10, but yep. because of the deficit the with Liam Henry, they had to go back to pick 12. Oh, is it, oh, is that and right? then obviously okay. with some uh, bids and all that, they yep. probably end up around pick 15. Okay, I understand. Yep. So, um, so who, as a fan, Fremantle fan, yep. um, we're looking at their list needs. Uh, who do you want Fremantle to look at? Um, they need some speed into that uh, midfield. Um, and so they'll get that with their two academy boys in Brandon Walker and Joel Weston, who are more likely to be in that 20 to 40 uh, range. Yep. They probably do need another forward option now that Hogan is gone. And True. if they do want a lob rucking, they probably do need another uh, key forward or at least another medium-sized uh, sure. forward. Um, and so maybe one kid that springs to mind is Oliver Henry, yep. who is actually Jack Henry's brother That's from true. Long. So yep. he's a medium forward, he's strong in the air, and he's pretty capable at ground level as well. Mm. The other f- person who I like is a kid called Jack Carroll from East Fremantle. Now, even though Jack is a midfielder, David Mundy is more closer to the end than he is the beginning. So mm. they might be looking at someone to replace Mundy. Um, but I think one of those two options is who Freo should be looking at, or a player like those two. Yeah, I like the idea of looking for like that sort of medium, if we're like a Dugowy sort of yeah. type that can cram and can mm. sort of give you a lead as well. Like I reckon that sort of forward line, forward character would add a point of difference. So I really wanted us to have a real red hot crack when Stevenson looked like he's out the door because yeah. I wanted Longmuir to play the assistant coach card because yeah. Stevenson in our forward line yeah. would have been spicy. The um, thing though with that, and sometimes it does happen when a assistant coach does leave another club is they might have to sign a deal where for the first year or two they can't take a certain amount of players with them is that right is that actually yeah. a thing that yeah. might be a, yeah Aish is probably sense. charity or something well, i think Aish <laughs> yes. helped collingwood as much as it helped yeah you, so yeah yeah so um i think that might be a reason why uh Freo couldn't really make a play for stevenson or phillips who i was really looking at yeah, yeah phillips would have yeah. made sense yeah, yeah. so um, i liked both yeah, so, I mean... But they wanted them out the door. You think Collingwood would be happy to deal with someone they know mm, in that yeah. sort of high I, I think call. North was probably just always going yeah. to be a better suitor for Stevenson. I think he, yeah. he trained with them beforehand. Yeah. Um, loosely With his AIS program. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, yeah, no, I can't have them all. Mm. But, yeah, I guess like a, a forward mid who can... He's always like another option. Yeah. I think I nominated Flanders last year yeah. as being a good option. And um, you do have Sturt there. I know he's not yeah. not the same sort of play. He's more of like a target forward, but yeah. he could still come on and, and yeah. add to something that you don't quite have. And in moment. some of uh, the games he played earlier this year, he looked very capable at mm. the next level. So Yeah, like I think it was uh, round two against Essendon. Did he kick yeah. three? Something yeah. Like that. He looked pretty good. So yeah. I think it was round two. Might have been Rising round star one. round one, yeah. yeah. Round one then, yeah. yeah. There you go. He won Rising Star before she did the fan. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, right. But yeah, I think their future is quite exciting at Freo. Yep. Um, they're starting to get their off-field um, areas fixed up, which is about bloody time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think there is a strong culture at Fremantle now. Like you can yeah. see, Long Wheel starting to employ yeah. that. Hence, you kind of Blakely, Cam McCarthy, Jesse Hogan for ve- for different reasons are yep. not part of the club where maybe there were sort of maybe some off. Blakely's still there. around, isn't he? I think Sorry, he was, but yeah. he was trade bait. Yeah, he was if you believe bait. the he reports, he was. He's at least been sort of shifted yeah. out. That's you're yeah. right though. Yeah. yeah mistake um so i would normally ask about my club here west the west coast eagles who yeah. enter the draft at pick 62 so there's not really much point asking you who you think they'll take but uh this is probably a good segue into some maybe some diamonds in the rough because you, yeah. you have a good sort of understanding deeper in the draft mature ages as well anyone yep. you think could feature later in the draft yep so this might sound like I'm somewhat dismissing west coast but i think they're a club that just needs to get depth into that team mm-hmm. um and I'll say that because they've got a lot of good young players in uh, that club. So, you know, you've got Josh Rotham, who looks like the perfect replacement for Schofield. Mm. You've got Waterman. Uh, you've got Ainsworth. I mean, Oscar Allen just looks like a star already. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Oscar. Yeah. And you've got Jack Petrocelli there. Um, so probably for them, they're probably hoping more for that organic growth to come through the ranks. Mm. Yeah. Um, so they, um, now in saying that, I know they've been linked to a kid called Shannon Neal. I have South heard that from too. Antle. Yeah, is he a ruckman? He's a ruckman forward or right. f- or forward ruck. I'm, Interesting. I think he's a forward ruck because he's more of a forward that can ruck. Okay. And so for the fans out there that don't know what I mean by that is like if you're a forward ruck, it's you're a forward who can ruck. If yeah, you're a ruck yeah. forward, you're a ruckman who can drift forward. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Because that's not a list need for us because uh, yeah. we've added. Um, Bailey Williams is someone I'm very bullish on as well. Yep. We added Callum Jamison last year. Yep. But that being said, I think it's 62. 
and you might agree, it's a case of if you think this kid has the talent to make the grade, you pick him, rather yeah. than pick him, say, we need a midfielder, pick a far inferior, in our perception, talented yeah. midfielder. Yeah. It's better to just go for the kid you want yeah. and then Although, look at your assets later. In saying that, they might look at a kid called Max Spivey from Claremont, who yeah. he's like a smaller half forward flanker that can go into the midfield. Yeah. And he's got a bit of speed and... Because guys like Luke Shu is 31, you, they might be thinking, mm. oh, we should develop this kid for another two, three years, and then hopefully Shuey stays around for a bit longer than that for you yeah, guys. Yeah. But if he does end up going, suddenly you've got the perfect replacement for him to come in. I get anxiety when people bring up how old Shuey is, because I still feel like he's a kid. He's my favourite player. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I just it doesn't feel like that long ago I was waiting for him to like make a name for himself. <laughs> so that's scary thought that he might be done soon. I got an Eagles hypothetically, and you could probably comment on this guy generally. What... About the hypothetical of them bringing back Alec Waterman. Great call. But comment on him yes. generally as yes. well. Um, so I think Alec will probably go more as a... Well, obviously. I don't think he'll be their first option because I think sure. their forward line's pretty well sorted. You've yeah. got Darling, who I think is still 27 when I last Yeah, saw he's it. a year older than me, so he might be 28. Yeah, so he's, yeah. So he's still young. You've got JK, who's probably going to be there for another year. You've got Liam, oh, Ryan, the wings. Liam Ryan there yeah. who can just... Do it yeah. in the air, on the ground, wherever. Yeah. Um, but they might look at maybe, a, and obviously Alex a medium-sized forward, so it makes sense for them to maybe look at someone like him because Daniel Venables, I think, is still suffering concussion. Yeah, I don't think we can bank on him at all. Yeah. I think we have to almost trade it like that's done and just hope yeah. for the best, but yes. Yeah, and the other thing is, and I don't know if you guys can help me out with this, I still don't know what's going on with Willie Rioli. So no one does. I so, haven't heard. Yeah. I believe he was, I remember reading a report saying he's going to find out this week, but I don't think there was any clarification on that. Um, yeah. I think from what from the scuttlebutt is the Eagles are praying for two yeah. and preparing for four years. Yeah. Um, so I think, again, like Venables, you have to plan for he might not come back and just yeah. hope for the best. Yeah, So and that's probably why they're probably then going to lack that medium forward. So... Maybe someone like Alec Waterman does yeah. uh, come into their equation. Well, he was drafted originally as an inside midfielder, so he's kind of added that to his game. Obviously yeah. caught uh, glandular fever that wrecked him for like two to three years. Yeah. Um, it, had a, it really rocked him from all reports and kind of ruined his career. So I don't know if he has scope to be a forward midfielder because yeah. that is something we would never say no to. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's not even just a West Coast question, I think. Yeah. Um, I didn't I, mean it broadly, but I thought yeah. West Coast specificately because the father-son connection, they, he was on their list before, yeah. but due to the... And obviously his brother's there now yeah. as well, yeah. so imagine that, the two yeah. brothers in the same forward I know, line. that would be great. It could, <laughs> is it actually possible to father-son a player twice? It's never happened before. Oh, I, it would be pretty awesome if it did happen. Yeah, <laughs> father-son twice. I don't see why he couldn't, but hmm. yeah, I'm sure there's, it's not even legislated for it. So it's maybe it's just for your initial draft the father-son thing though like yeah but i just i mean I, I don't think there's a rule written down stipulating mm. either way because it's just <laughs> such an unprecedented thing so, uh, but yeah the day list of father-son then bring him back yeah. years later yeah, yeah that'd be sick yeah. anyway um i think that probably just about wraps up our little draft preview here um thank you so much time for, uh, for your time lenny it's uh it's really good insight from you and um without saying too much we might we might have you on the podcast um in in the near future as well so we'll yeah. see what happens there so yeah. fingers crossed um Something so, yeah. interesting, we'll see. Okay, <laughs> you made it weird. <laughs> 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 nah, um, but yeah, thanks so much for your time, man. And um, yeah. Thanks for having me on again. It's always a pleasure on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. thanks, mate. No worries. Um, yeah, cheers. And uh, I guess for our listeners, make sure you buy Manscaped products 20% off using the code TRUEFOOTY20. And uh, stay subscribed. Subscribe. Are you? Are you wearing the Manscaped yeah. shirt? Oh yeah. man, grabbed it fresh out of the wash. You're a good brand ambassador. And there's two <laughs> new ones in the pack as well. True. Ooh. Yeah. More on that later. So yeah. Thanks, Lenny. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you on the next podcast.